All right, everyone, it's just about 8 p.m., so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to thank everyone for logging in and Zooming in to join us tonight um, for our um, COVID-19 Critical Care Training Forum. My name is Christine Bojanowski. I am an assistant professor of medicine at Tulane University in New Orleans in the section of pulmonary diseases, critical care medicine, and environment, or critical care and environmental medicine. Um, and I will be your moderator for tonight. Um, these have definitely been um, crazy months. We're so happy that you're taking the time to um, join us and participate in these worthwhile sessions. I wanted to share a little bit of further encouragement and a little bit of New Orleans love with everyone here with this artwork. Um, while we are going back into the phases of reopening phases, the past several months have had the French Quarter um, with the windows and the doors largely shuttered and boarded up. And then the city's response to that was to have artists go to them and paint words of inspiration um, and inspirational messages and thank you messages. So this is a compilation of some of that work from, from, um, from, the, from the New Orleans to you guys. This is, um, so on behalf of the Critical Care um, Training Forum, I am extremely happy and proud to be a part of this initiative. Um, this would not be uh, possible without the incredible educators and organizers that we have here in this um, CCTF leadership team. Before we get started, I want to share one little message um, that was shared with Dr. Celadon. There's an excellent um, uh, resource and an untapped resource largely um, of a national student called the National Student Re Response Network or NSRN. As we all know, many medical students um, and other healthcare profession, um, professional students have um, had to be um, moved away from their institutions um, and open-ended um, having to continue their studies uh, remotely. So this leaves a large group of people that are extremely motivated and eager to help with efforts in their local communities. Um, Past examples of some prior efforts they have, uh, have done um, include assisting in COVID-19 lab result dissemination via telehealth or telephone systems, grocery shopping or childcare uh, for overworked healthcare providers on the front lines, PPE organization and distribution, telehealth triage or contact tracing. Um, if this is something that you or your organization or your group um, uh, find that this could be potentially very helpful to you, please check them out. Their website is nsrnhealth.org. You can also reach out to their leadership, Mr. Terrence Hughes, at the email listed below. Um, as you guys know, we've been doing these sessions every week on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Last week, if you were able to, to tune in and join us, um, just to recap what was covered, Dr. Erica Lynn um, from UCSD, a fellow there, presented a COVID case. This is followed by discussions on radiologic findings in COVID, on updates and controversies in COVID care, and immune responses in COVID-19. So if you were able to join us at last week, that's awesome. If not, do not fear. Um, all of our prior episodes, all nine uh, previously have been posted on the ATS website. They're available for free. Simply just search Google for ATS COVID form. It should pop up, or you can also use the link that you find here as well. I would definitely take, encourage you guys to take advantage of that. Without um, much further ado, um, welcome to our 10th episode, our 10th session. We have a really stellar of speakers and discussants tonight that I'm so happy to introduce to all of you. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a brief layout of the organization for this evening. We'll be presenting a very challenging ICU case. Um, then we will move into pulmonary disease kind of considerations and complications both before and after COVID-19 infection. This will be headed off by Nicole, Dr. Nicole uh, Lapinel. She is from Louisiana State University Health Science Center here in New Orleans. She's an assistant clinical professor of medicine. She's also the co-director of the LSU Mycobacterial Disease and Bronchiectasis Program. This will be followed by another case presentation by um, Jonah Priniski. He is one of our third year Tulane University internal medicine residents. 
He is graduating this Saturday, He's still joining us tonight, which is pretty awesome. He is going into pulmonary and critical care, but not before he finishes a research fellowship at Harvard Medical School in Global Health and Social Medicine. We'll then be moving on to Dr. Timothy Amos. He is going to be talking about um, post-COVID complications in pulmonary disease. Um, and his talk is entitled, So You've Had COVID-19, Now What? He's an assistant professor of medicine. He holds positions at the University of Colorado School of Medicine and the Department of Veterans Affairs, Eastern Colorado Healthcare System. And then we'll be wrapping up tonight on um, a discussion entitled Ventilator Sharing During an Acute Shortage from the COVID-19 Epicenter in New York. This will be led by Dr. Jeremy Beitler. Um, he is an assistant professor of medicine. He's also the director of clinical research for the Center for Acute Respiratory Failure at Columbia, Columbia University. We're really lucky to have him here to share his experiences with us and his expertise. Before we jump in, please just take a moment and scan this into your phones. This is a survey monkey. Please definitely give us feedback on about today's forum. Um, and on those, you'll have the opportunity to include any questions that you have, any topics of interest for upcoming episodes, okay? Um, during the, uh, the entirety of this talk, please feel free to um, include um, any questions that you might have um, in the chat box below. I'll be kind of fielding those out for you guys. Depending on the time, we may be saving them um, to the very end of the, the discussion, okay? So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass this on to uh, Dr. Leong. All right, well, thank you, Christy. Um, so I'm gonna be presenting a case of COVID-19 in an immunosuppressed patient. So this is a 27-year-old male uh, with past medical history of tobacco abuse. Uh, he presented with a two-month history of progressive dyspnea, which acutely worsened over two days prior to presentation. Uh, over the past six months, he's experienced a 100-pound weight loss, which was unintentional. And when he presented to the outside hospital emergency department, he presented with severe hypoxia and increased worker breathing, was subsequently intubated, and started on broad-spectrum antibiotics. This is his second chest, to, or chest x-ray um, after presenting. And we can see here a large pneumothorax on the right. There's already a pigtail catheter in place here. Um, we see significant bilateral, apically predominant cystic lung disease, as well as diffuse opacities. And he then went to the CT scanner, and this is his CT of his chest. So we can already see some subcutaneous air, once more the bilateral cystic, um, apically predominant lung lesions. There's diffuse ground glass opacifications and uh, consolidation bilaterally. We can see that right pneumothorax once more. So testing came back positive for COVID-19. Uh, he was also tested for HIV, which came back positive AIDS um, with a CD4 count of 32. The patient was started on remdesivir and then underwent diagnostic bronchoscopy given the concern for PCP, PGP uh, pneumonia and that antigen came back positive. The patient was then started on Bactrim and steroids. A couple days uh, after admission, the patient then experienced worsening hypotension and hypoxia. Still had that continued air leak on the right, uh, which was concerning for bronchoalveolar pleural fistula. Um, the repeat chest film, which we can see here at the right, showed still residual pneumothorax on the right, but now a large pneumothorax as well on the left. Uh, the patient underwent uh, pigtail catheter replacements, two on the left. The second one after the first one failed to evacuate the pneumothorax uh, fully. So here's a quick question, just feel free to type them out in the chat. Um, what are some important ventilator considerations in the setting of bronchopleural fistulas? A, can cause double triggering. B, do you want to minimize peak airway pressures? C, do you want to minimize PEEP? D, do you want to minimize chest tube suction pressure? Or E, all of the above? All right, and the answer is E, all of the above. So. Um, having bronchial pleural fistula can definitely cause double triggering. Essentially, you're having flow that's being uh, stolen away from the alveoli. The patient wants to take deeper and longer breaths. And you can see in this diagram at the right in this ventilator, um, this is what's happening. The patient's taking inspiration. As soon as that inspiratory cycle is done, the patient's still inhaling and we're seeing a second inspiratory uh, cycle initiated. And it makes sense um, with B and C. We want to minimize peak airway pressures and PEEP. As you can imagine, if your upstream pressure is uh, really high, you can increased flow across the downstream hole, 
and make that bronchopleural fistula worse. And the same thing with minimizing chest tube suction pressure downstream. If you've got a really high negative pressure downstream, that could also um, increase flow across that bronchopleural fistula and worsen it. So a couple of days after hospitalization, the patient became more hypotensive, required really high dose vasopressors, and we saw this arterial waveform on the right noted. As you can see, there's some significant respiratory variation we see here. Um, and, and because of this, we ordered an EKG, and this is the EKG that we got. So we see here some really significant infralateral um, ST segment elevation, not the typical ones that we see in STEMIs, as well as some T wave inversions in the early precordial leads and some PR depression. All right, so what's our next step in management? Do we activate the cardiac cath lab? Do we start some antiplatelets, statin, anticoagulation? Do we get an echocardiogram? Do we administer some volume, push thrombolytics? All right, so we're gonna get two things simultaneously. Sorry, I cheated a little bit here. Um, one, we're gonna administer some volume because we wanna treat what we think is going on. And two, we wanna get the test that we can help diagnose what's going on. And so we ended up putting a probe on this uh, gentleman's chest. Uh, this is a subcostal view. Unfortunately, as you can imagine with bilateral pneumothoraces, you're not gonna great, get great subcostal or um, peristernal or apical views. So here we can see an, a very large anterior pericardial effusion. We see this most anterior chamber is the right ventricle, posterior is the left ventricle. And it's subtle here, but at kind of the end of diastole, you can see the right ventricle um, collapse. All right, so what are some echocardiographic signs that are consistent with tamponade physiology? And I have to preface this by saying this can, these can be consistent with tamponade physiology, but tamponade really is a clinical diagnosis. A, RA or RV diastolic collapse. B, an enlarged IVC. C, aortic valve peak velocity with respiratory variation. And D, the AV valve inflow velocities with respiratory variation, or E, all of the above. And this is an E, all of the above. So here are some examples of this. So this top left um, picture here is essentially that same view, but with M mode. And what M mode is, is this line that we can see at the top plotted out over time in this lower diagram. So if we look here in the middle, we can see this is the uh, ventricular septum. It moves in in systole, goes out in diastole, moves in in systole, goes out in diastole. And you can see at the end of diastole, this top one line here is the RV free wall. There's collapses there. Um, and this happens because your pericardial pressure is higher than your right ventricular pressure at the end of diastole, leading to collapse and inability to full, uh, fill that right ventricle. This middle picture here is a pulse wave Doppler of the left ventricular outflow tract. And basically what we're looking for here is differences in peak velocity with respiratory variation more than 25%. And essentially this is um, pulses paradoxus on echocardiogram. And then the top right here, um, we've got IVC dilatation. Once more, this is an M mode of the IVC, and you can see the IVC is very dilated, and this happens because we've got backup of pressures from the right atrium or right ventricle uh, to the IVC. All right, so the patient underwent pericardiocentesis, pericardial drain was placed, about 250 cc's of serous fluid came off, and almost immediately the patient came off of pressures. Uh, a couple of days later, once more, the patient had worsening hypoxia, hypotension, and a repeat chest film was done um, in the setting of a continued large air leak um, through both the right and left chest tubes. And this is the chest film on the right here. And we can see once more a really large right pneumothorax with mediastinal shift to the left. And because despite having a 14 French uh, chest tube on the right, we were unable to fully evacuate that right uh, pneumothorax, which was now becoming tension physiology, we decided to place a right 28 French surgical chest tube. Immediately after we placed this chest tube, the patient had significant desaturations. We noted that there was a massive air leak on the right from that chest tube that we just placed. And if we kind of look here, sorry, this is a, a poor diagram, but this is a pleurovac essentially. And we can grade how much the leak is by how far it goes down. One being low, seven to be high. And this patient had bubbles all the way down to seven. Uh, there was also a worsening air leak on the vent, and this can be evidence on uh, your ventilator way, um, ventilator, and in this particular ventilator, we see it in the right lower corner. And look down here, the tidal volumes going in, inspiratory tidal volumes were 500, and the expiratory tidal volumes were 100. So this is indicative of a significant air leak in the situation. At the same time we placed this um, right surgical chest tube, the 
air leak on the left chest tubes almost immediately disappeared. All right, so what do we do? We have a desatting patient right in front of us, and what happened? So are we gonna needle decompression in the left lung? Are we gonna increase PEEP? Administer some volume? Are we gonna transiently surgically uh, clamp the surgical chest tube? So we transiently clamped the surgical chest tube, and almost immediately after we clamped that chest tube, the patient's saturations rose, the air leak improved on the ventilator, and the patient was looking much better. So what happened? Um, so by placing a large chest tube on the right, we dramatically decreased the resistance uh, flow through that bronchopleural fistula. And because of that, there was more flow going to the right, and we were preferentially ventilating the right lung bronchopleural fistula with less flow going to the left lung. With less flow going to the left lung, we had decreased flow through that bronchopleural fistula on the left. There was no air leak through the ch left chest tubes because of that, and overall we had less overall effective alveolar ventilation and subsequent desaturations. So after we slowly released um, and unclamped that right chest tube, the air leak slowed over time. We decided to place a left uh, 28 French surgical chest tube in order to fully uh, alleviate the pneumothorax on the left, which um, did not uh, decrease despite having those two pigtails on the left. And we had bilateral lung re-expansion. Um, the air leak decreased over a couple of days. Um, we had decreased oxygen and vent requirements. The patient was successfully extubated and the air leak almost immediately, kind of what we talked about earlier after extubation, um, decreased. And after about three more days, there was no residual air leak and repeat chest film showed um, no residual pneumothorax and the patient is recovering and doing well. Awesome. Thank you, Kieran. That was a great presentation, really complicated case. All right, we'll move on. Uh, Dr. Lapinel. All right, can you see everything okay? We're good, looks great. All right, fantastic. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, just wanna say thank you to the uh, ATS uh, Critical Care Training Forum team for inviting me to speak. Um, my talk is gonna be a little bit um, anecdotal to a certain extent, um, as I'm sure many of the talks have been before me um, since we're kind of in a data-free zone, except I guess that data is ever increasing over these weeks as we go through the COVID crisis. But I will be talking about COVID-19 and structural lung disease. All right. So just starting simply with what we do know, um, we do know that patients with asthma um, that uh, is moderate to severe patients with COPD, which includes patients with emphysema and chronic bronchitis, patients with underlying interstitial lung disease and cystic fibrosis are at increased risk of severe COVID-19. So what is severe infection with COVID-19 entail? Uh, basically, according to the WHO definition, that is severe acute respiratory illness, which includes fever, at least one respiratory sign or symptom, uh, which would be something such as cough or shortness of breath, and basically that those patients then require hospitalization. So in talking about COVID-19 and structural lung disease, um, we do look for risk factors that are presumed to be associated with an increased risk of severe COVID-19. Um, these risk factors have been extrapolated basically from COPD um, in association with community acquired pneumonia. So these risk factors are presumably um, related to one, alterations in local and systemic inflammatory response, impaired host immunity, uh, an imbalance in the microbiome, in some patients persistent mucus production, and um, also related to the use of inhaled and systemic steroids. So again, I highlight those risk factors that can be extrapolated. Now that not all patients with underlying uh, chronic lung disease are going to have mucus production and may or may not be on systemic steroids, but these um, are important risk factors as well. Another risk factor that seems to be very specific to COPD in particular um, in the category of structural lung diseases is the increased expression of ACE2 that's found in these patients. So there have been individual studies that have looked to see whether in particular COPD patients seem to have a higher 
risk of more severe disease. So while I state that they're included in that, that higher risk group, um, you know, many have sought to look whether or not COPD patients in particular have more severe disease. And there was a meta-analysis that was just published a few weeks back um, that found that there was in fact a five-fold increased risk of severe COVID infection in COPD patients. Um, overall, among COVID-19 cases, we know that, um, that most cases are gonna be associated with an underlying health condition. So cardiovascular disease accounts for 32% and diabetes for 30% of those, but chronic lung disease um, is, accounts for about 18% of those patients. And what we do know is that hospitalizations are six times higher and deaths are 12 times higher for COVID-19 patients that do have underlying conditions. Here, I just wanted to include, um, this was actually just published um, yesterday in The Lancet. Um, and basically what we're looking at here um, is they sought to do an estimation of individuals that were at risk for severe COVID infection. And they stratified it based on age, sex, uh, the country of origin and underlying comorbidities. The purpose of the model uh, was to create a potential tool for mitigating the effects of the virus um, as it related to higher risk cohorts. And, um, and so the hope is that if, the, if you can identify these higher risk groups, and I draw your attention over to the last column, um, the third column on the right there, where they basically stratify uh, based on country of origin, um, uh, those are the rows that are you seen there, and then they list the underlying comorbidities. And if you look at the one that's in royal blue, that's basically um, stratified according to age, um, that the royal blue segment are those with underlying respiratory diseases. And so that's just to give you a worldwide kind of like a, a glance at um, just what a significant population of uh, patients we're dealing with that have underlying respiratory disease that are increased risk. So now I'll just take you briefly through um, some cases that I've encountered over these last couple of months. Um, so I, you know, I will say um, when Dr. Bojanowski introduced me, I am a co-director for a mycobacterial disease program. And um, we also uh, treat, we also receive patients that are referred for treatment of bronchiectasis. So um, just from our standpoint, we have about 200 patients um, in our referral base that we see on a regular basis. And among those, three of those patients ended up um, contracting COVID. Um, here, I'll present you with two of the patients from our cohort. And then the last one is um, basically, or actually the second one is a COPD patient that I cared for in the ILTAC. He was actually um, one patient, I'll get to him, but the one patient among the rest that I was taking care of that were actually not trached um, in the LTAC. But starting with case number one, patient EB, she was an 83-year-old female who had a past medical history of squamous cell lung cancer. She was treated with single beam radiation therapy for definitive treatment. She was being seen by us because she also had underlying MAC and bronchiectasis. Her PFT showed normal spirometry and normal lung volumes, but she had a decreased diffusion capacity at 51%. And what I just show you there is just her baseline x-ray um, where you can see there's kind of some underlying chronic lung disease, bilateral interstitial opacities, but overall what's glaring is you see that the mass that was identified, um, that was her squamous cell lung cancer that was treated with radiation therapy. Here are some slices of her baseline CT scans also from when uh, the mass was diagnosed. Um, so basically she developed symptoms that started with a loss of taste and smell at the very beginning. And then she went on to develop productive cough, weakness, fatigue, sore throat, and anorexia uh, for subsequent seven days. She ended up, um, she was in contact with us, and when she started spiking higher fevers, um, we told her that she needed to really present to the emergency room. Um, she needed to undergo testing. So this is very, at the very beginning of the pandemic as it affected New Orleans. So this was really in, in about uh, early to mid-March here. So she basically underwent testing. Um, her COVID was pending because that was going to take another seven or so days for that to come back. Um, and she was discharged on a course of augmentin. She ends up returning to the hospital a few days later because she had worsening fever. So her Tmax had gone up to 103. She was also complaining of a little bit more short of breath, shortness of breath, um, and basically required uh, two liters nasal cannula. <clears throat> 
So luckily for this patient, um, she was hospitalized and she was monitored um, and her disease course never actually worsened. She was basically monitored for four days and then subsequently discharged on room air. So she hadn't even required supplemental oxygen. She ended up having a CT scan uh, two months later um, and, uh, and these were the findings. So they looked very much similar to her baseline CT scan um, from the year before. We see, we see that there is a persistent mass, albeit um, it has, had decreased in size um, under radiation therapy. She had scattered pulmonary nodules on her baseline CT scan that are still present but actually have improved as well as some tree and bud opacities. Now, I didn't include um, on those previous CT scans down to the bases. Um, I didn't go as far down as, I, as I'm showing you the cuts on this CT scan, but you can see there's actually some reticular opacities in the bases. So she actually had some new onset fibrosis, um, fibrotic changes, I should say, that were not present on prior CT scans. But overall, her, her scans didn't look too bad. And to this day, she's actually doing quite well, just with a little bit of persistent uh, fatigue. So then this brings me to our second case, um, patient TL. So this is the 72-year-old male uh, that I happened upon um, after in the LTAC after a prolonged um, course in the hospital. Actually, I had two different hospitalizations. So his past medical history was significant for COPD. He was on four-liter nasal cannula at home and underlying hypertension and hyperlipidemia. No PFTs on file. He was cared for by a, a pulmonologist um, uh, at, uh, outside um, New Orleans here. So he presented with symptoms of shortness of breath for seven days and a non-productive cough. And that's his, um, his chest x-ray there, uh, his baseline chest x-ray. During his hospital course, he ended up being treated for a COPD exacerbation. So he received a course of steroids um, as well as antibiotics. Um, and his maximum O2 requirements uh, were 60% on the venti mast. He was subsequently dis discharged to a sniff. Um, as you see there, that was a repeat chest x-ray just prior to his discharge, which showed that there was a little bit more of an evolving right upper lobe infiltrate there. But overall, his x-rays are consistent with his underlying emphysema. He has severe hyperinflation bilaterally. Uh, prior to his discharge to the SNF, um, he was, his code status was actually changed to DNR. So unfortunately for him, he returned to the hospital with fever, cough, and shortness of breath about a month later. Um, and they ended up performing a CTA, and I just show um, his, uh, just a few slices um, of his imaging there. Um, just I'd like to make the point here that um, I think as, as, is, as is the case in many of the hospitals here throughout the United States, we weren't actually performing a great deal of CT scans in these patients. Um, I think, you know, the experience was different over in China, but here, you know, we wanted to mitigate exposure. We wanted to save the CT scan rooms for, you know, patients that really needed them emergently. Um, because as things evolved, really our testing that had taken seven to ten days um, at most to return had then, uh, within a matter of a couple of weeks, we were starting to be able to get results within, um, within 24 hours at some of the hospitals here. So as you can see in the CT scan, um, he has really pretty significant evolving right upper lobe infiltrate, um, and, and uh, he also had a new right-sided pleural effusion. I really wanted to show these images for the fact that, you know, not only does he have an obvious pneumonia, but you really see that this gentleman, you know, had pretty advanced uh, emphysematous lung changes. So for him, he, um, his disposition, um, he actually, again, was just treated with a course of antibiotics um, and with steroids, um, and he was awaiting discharge to the LTAC. So in order to be discharged safely to the LTAC, he had to have a couple of uh, COVIDs that ended up returning the, the RT-PCR needed to return negative before he would be able to be discharged. So I also just point out here that it was interesting that it took quite a while for this gentleman to convert from, um, from positive to negative. You see this first positive was at, it was March 25th, and then subsequently it was almost two months um, before he had his first negative. So he was ultimately discharged to the LTAC, still on very high oxygen requirements. Um, and even at the LTAC, he required uh, a few more uh, courses of steroids. And he actually was just recently, as of today, placed on hospice care. And then our last case, so case number three. 
61 year old female um, who had quite a significant complicated uh, past medical history, which included sarcoidosis, obesity, sleep apnea, pulmonary hypertension, bronchiectasis, pulmonary MAC infection. She also had a history of PE and she had chronic hypoxic respiratory failure on two to three liter nasal cannula. So her medication, she was chronically immune suppressed um, as a result of her underlying sarcoidosis. So she was on prednisone that fluctuated between 10 to 40 milligrams. She was also on weekly methotrexate. Um, and then we also had her on treatment for um, her underlying pulmonary MAC with rifampin, ethambutol, and amikacin. Her pulmonary function tests at baseline showed moderate obstruction. Um, she did have normal lung volumes and a decreased diffusion capacity of 45%. And that um, right there is a baseline chest x-ray on her. Um, and here's a baseline chest CT for her as well. Um, and just again, just to, to demonstrate the severity of her underlying uh, chronic lung disease, um, you know, great deal of cystic by um, bronchiectatic changes. Um, nodular infiltrates in places, but also fibrotic changes uh, down to the bases there, along with some traction bronchiectasis scattered throughout. So she developed symptoms um, related to COVID that included cough, extreme fatigue, nausea, decreased appetite, and progressive shortness of breath. And I show you um, her x-ray on March 18th, which is when she had first presented to the emergency room. Um, and then a test x-ray then that was completed a few days later, and you can see there that she has, actually has an angiotracheal tube there on the right. So her hospital course um, was more unfortunate than the other two. Um, so as I said, she'd originally presented on March 18th. She'd had shortness of breath for two days um, and was discharged from the emergency room. She came back to the emergency room five days later with worsening shortness of breath and required intubation on arrival. She had a, a couple of days stay in the ICU and was actually extubated two days later. Um, she was then monitored overnight before being stepped down to the floor um, the following day, and she was actually on venti mask at 50%. Unfortunately, over the next uh, 24 hours, um, she didn't fare as well. And the following morning, while getting up to use the commode, um, she ended up uh, desatting down to the 50s, had to be intubated, and uh, uh, ended up suffering PEA arrest. So just to, to take a little walk back through, these were all three different patients uh, with underlying chronic lung disease of varying etiology um, who um, were infected with COVID and had variable outcomes. So this last patient, you know, ended up uh, succumbing to her otherwise chronic comorbidities, but as well as the COVID on top of it and went into PEA arrest. A 72-year-old gentleman who had severe underlying COPD um, and, um, you know, an end-stage lung disease as it was, managed to avoid intubation uh, despite having COVID infection, um, but unfortunately has basically been in the hospital for these last almost now three months um, and is now transitioning to hospice care. And then lastly, the 83-year-old female um, who, while battling cancer and underlying bronchiectasis and pulmonary MAC, um, really developed a self-limited course of hypoxia and was discharged in good shape. And I just leave you with a question of, you know, so what we don't know is actually what the long-term sequela of COVID will be in, these cohort, in this cohort of patients for those that do manage to survive it. So just some take-home points that I, that I leave you with are that patients with structural lung disease, they will very much be aware um, of their increased vulnerability and increased risk for COVID-19. And it's important that we address this um, you know, for those patients that we, that we chronically follow on the outside. So maintaining effective communication with these patients via telehealth is vital to one, minimizing their exposure risks. So they're not going to the urgent care centers, they're not going to the emergency rooms unnecessarily. Um, and so with that, to, to keeping their underlying disease under control in order to minimize that. One, uh, subsequent, you know, early hospitalization should be recommended if symptoms are worsening because these are the patients that, you know, could very well have a, a poorer course. And lastly, that outcomes will vary and every patient should be managed on a case-by-case -case basis. Not all rules can be applied the same. Thank you. Awesome.
Christy, I can't see I you. Got it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. So um, while Jonah, um, please go ahead and start sharing your screen. Um, thank you, Dr. Lavinall. That was an awesome talk. Um, and definitely, I think we'll get more clarity, hopefully, over the, over the coming months. Um, before... Um, before we get started with our second case presentation, um, I would really like to just call everyone's attention again to the chat box. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and feed them onto there. Um, otherwise, I still call your attention there because many of the articles and references that our speakers are um, sharing um, during their talks are being fed directly into this uh, group chat. Okay, so we'll go on with the second, um, the second case. And we are really looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me here. I just want to confirm that you can see the presentation and that you can hear me. Yes, we're good, Jonah. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so this case uh, is the story of a 61-year-old man from New Orleans who had several comorbidities uh, but was generally functionally well and not immunosuppressed prior to this admission. He was admitted to our ICU for severe COVID pneumonia complicated by ARDS requiring mechanical ventilation. And this case actually begins on the 23rd day of mechanical ventilation for this patient. Um, on day 24 of mechanical ventilation, the patient had a slightly increasing oxygen requirement and a repeat chest x-ray was obtained. The image on the right shows his chest x-ray on day 24, and the image on the left shows his chest x-ray five days previous. Clearly, the image on the right is remarkable for what appears to be a cavitary lung lesion in the right upper lobe. Unfortunately, uh, as Dr. Lapinow was alluding to, um, because of infection control restrictions during the height of our epidemic in New Orleans, uh, we were unable to obtain a chest CT at that time, given the patient's SARS-CoV-2 positive status. However, broad-spectrum antibiotics were initiated, and the patient was monitored closely. Four days later, the patient was found to be SARS-CoV-2 negative. Um, he had converted on PCR testing, and he continued to experience low-grade fevers despite broad-spectrum antibiotics. At that time, CT chest was obtained and is shown in panel B. As compared to the patient's admission chest CT in panel A, which demonstrates typical findings of COVID pneumonia, the panel B image now shows a large cavitary lung lesion as previously suggested on his chest x-ray. Diagnostics obtained at that time showed a leukocytosis but that was unchanged from previous days. A procalcitonin was obtained, which was also elevated, but again, unchanged from previous days. He was now SARS-CoV-2 negative, and a respiratory culture was obtained through mini-BAL, or non-bronchoscopic lavage. That initially showed normal flora, but was notable for some mold. A serum galactomannan was obtained. However, that was negative. The mold initially seen on the patient's respiratory culture speciated to Aspergillus fumigatus, and his antibiotic therapy was tailored to voriconazole. Within 48 hours of beginning voriconazole, the patient had defervesced. Within 10 days, he was stable enough to undergo trach and peg, having had diminishing oxygen requirements and no further fevers. By day 49, this patient was awake and conversing with his family and with the staff in the hospital. And five days later, he was able to leave the hospital. He's currently recovering well in an LTAC facility, undergoing significant rehab. So this case of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in COVID-19 raises some interesting questions. Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis has been frequently identified in severe influenza pneumonia um, and is increasingly recognized as a potential complication of COVID-19 ARDS. Interestingly, 
uh, as many as four case theories have now been published in journals such as the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, the Annals of Intensive Care, and others, showing an astoundingly high prevalence of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in severely ill COVID-19 patients in the ICU. These case theories had prevalence as high as 30%, um, which is remarkable, but also uh, a difficult uh, number to parse out. Because aspergillus is so prevalent in the environment and is such a frequent colonizer of the respiratory tract, distinguishing between aspergillus colonization and the pathology of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis is extremely complicated and still hotly investigated. So how is the diagnosis obtained clinically and how can we manage the condition? So the gold standard of diagnosis would be bronchoscopic biopsy and histopathology. But this is often impossible in patients with severe COVID-19, which necessitates clinical diagnosis with a high index of suspicion and a combination of different mycological tests. The mycological tests that are often employed include serum galactomannan, which in this patient was negative, highlighting the fact that serum galactomannan is thought to have a sensitivity of somewhere between 20 and 60 percent for patients who are non-neutropenic, such as patients with severe flu or patients with COVID-19, making serum galactomannan a less useful test. However, this patient underwent mini bronchoscopic lavage, which is thought to be a better specimen to run the serum galact or to run the galactomannan test on. It's also uh, a useful sample uh, for culture, which is how this diagnosis was obtained. Um, other mycologic tests include beta D glucan. However, this test lacks sensitivity or lacks specificity, as it can be positive in other fungal infections. Once the diagnosis is obtained, voriconazole is generally the preferred therapy, but it's often limited by patients. Uh, other organ dysfunctions, such as hepatic dysfunction. Amphotericin and echinocandin are not preferred therapies, but can be used if vorniconazole is not tolerated. Um, so the takeaway points from this case for us uh, really centered on a need for further investigation in order to parse out uh, the clinical management and diagnosis of, of IPA in COVID-19. Um, but I think the case series that we have at present uh, justify an increasing concern for co-infection with IPA in patients with COVID-19. Um, I would also highlight, again, the poor sensitivity of serum galactomannan as evidenced in this case where our patient was negative uh, but ultimately culture positive with a good clinical response to therapy. Um, I think that the BAL, the non-ronchospotic lavage obtained in our patient, ended up being very clinically useful. And I think that that's a relatively low risk procedure that could be recommended going forward. Um, and again, the high index of suspicion and the consideration of uh, initiation of antifungal therapy in patients with COVID-19 complicated by apparent superinfection not responding to typical broad spectrum antibiotic therapy. Key questions for research going forward are highlighted on the right uh, in this article from the Lancet Microbe in May um, and really center around the role of screening if these case theories with prevalence as high as 20 or 30 percent are, are justifiable, then there's questions around how we're going to screen critically ill patients with COVID-19 for this extremely dangerous complication. And then whether, if the prevalence really is uh, remarkably high, what the role of prophylaxis might be. And then finally, how to identify cases given the constraints around bronchoscopy uh, and the complexity of mycologic diagnosis. Excellent job. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Kriniski. Um, I will also, again, point everyone back to the, um, to the chat page. There was a great question um, posed by Dr. Varsha uh, Taskar, um, and that was uh, regarding uh, D-dimer levels in patients with structural lung disease. It was addressed by Dr. Lapinel. Uh, <clears throat> um, additionally, um, a nice link was sent um, regarding COVID-19 associated uh, IPA. So please do check that out. And I will turn this over to Dr. Amos. All right, thank you very much.
Um, I, uh, Dr. Lappin, I'll ask the question at the end of hers, um, sort of what do we do after the hospitalization? So I've been tasked with answering that, and I want to uh, thank Dr. Bojanowski for including me in this um, and giving me a totally data-free topic to discuss. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it certainly raises the challenge, but I think that that's what we've been dealing with everything. And um, I don't have any disclosures. I wanted to just sort of give a couple objectives here. Um, I want to discuss the pulmonary complications of COVID. Uh, infection or illness, excuse me, after discharge from the hospital. And I'm going to use a case that we had here in Colorado as an example. Um, I'm going to review some lessons from some other respiratory infections, uh, previous SARS and MERS uh, epidemics as it pertains to lung function uh, long term. And then I'm going to outline the pretty sparse literature to date as it pertains to both COVID and lung function. Um, you know, and I think we're just starting to deal, uh, particularly in this country, with uh, as patients get out of the hospital, go to rehab, what the uh, long-term sequelae from this will be. And I think there's a lot to be answered on that. So uh, the case I want to present here, it's a 28-year-old obese male, uh, previous short-term smoker. I, mean, I think he'd smoked something like three cigarettes a day right before COVID uh, came a uh, pandemic. So he quit on admission to the hospital. Uh, but he was admitted to the ICU at the beginning of April, uh, COVID positive. Um, and he required high flow nasal cannula, 15 liters and up at times. Uh, also required to self prone. Uh, as a classic 28 year old, we had to move his bed so he could see the TV, otherwise, he would refuse to prone. Um, he had no uh, exposure during his time in the hospital to invasive or non invasive mechanical ventilation, which will become important here in a minute. And uh, being that this was early, he was treated with hydroxychloroquine and supportive care. And uh, he improved and was sent home on two liters uh, of oxygen. Uh, nasal cannula after about nine or 10 days. Two weeks after his discharge, uh, he presented back to the emer emergency department. He had acute onset chest pain, shortness of breath, and scant hemoptysis. And a chest x-ray at that time showed a right-sided pneumothorax, and he needed a tube thoracostomy. It was quite large. Though the pneumothorax rapidly resolved and his lungs stayed up, and in fact, the next day he was discharged home on room air. Two days later, uh, he returned to the emergency department with the exact same symptoms, uh, and this time he got a CAT scan. For a point of reference, here's his initial present, uh, presenting CAT scan to representative cuts when he presented with COVID, and you'll see uh, the, the sort of peripheral ground glass that we've been seeing uh, along the way with COVID. And then here um, is a follow-up scan that was done after the tube thoracostomy. So we've decompressed his pneumothorax, and he has this CAT scan here. And I'll draw your attention to a couple structural abnormalities um, uh, on this coronal view here, you'll see the uh, this sort of thin-walled cyst. And you'll see them scattered throughout, as well as this large uh, cavity that has some fluid-filled uh, components to it. Uh, these thin-walled cysts were determined by our radiologists to be uh, pneumatoceles. And then this large uh, uh, cystic with fluid component was actually deemed to be a uh, hydronumothorax uh, that was loculated at that time. Um, here's a sagittal view of that same, the same sort of cut. So you can see uh, these two pneumatoceles. And if uh, you go or were to remember back to the initial CAT scan, a lot of these pneumatoceles were in the initial pres, uh, excuse me, geographically in the area of the ground glass that he had at presentation. So of course, uh, we did quite an infectious workup. Um, uh, if anyone's familiar with pneumatoceles, and I'll tell you a little more about them in a minute, but a variety of different uh, infectious etiologies, HIV, uh, a variety of different fungal infections, PJP can be associated with cystic changes like this. All of that was negative, and his pneumothorax complete re completely resolved at five days, except for that loculated section that was in the fissure on the right. And his chest tube was removed, he remained well, he had a CAT scan at that point, and the pneumatoceles appeared a bit smaller. Uh, we just about two weeks ago got his one month follow up CAT scan and represented it here. You can see that the pneumatoceles have entirely resolved, uh, though there is still a bit of that loculated um, hydronumothorax there, though quite a bit better. Symptomatically, he's uh, near his baseline and doing quite a bit better. So pneumatoceles and pneumothoraces, um, this, these are seen in a number of conditions, and we have seen them in uh, previous viral epidemics. Um, Subpleural pneumatoceles and associated pneumothoraces were seen during H1N1 and the previous SARS, uh, and the reference is there uh, from 2004 in chest. Um, in these cases, uh, and we are seeing quite a bit of this with COVID, I've had several patients with this where they have these recurrent pneumothoraces while um, on the ventilator. Uh, and pneumatoceal development, the pathophysiology of it is thought to be associated with uh, sort of relative or regional trauma from the mechanical ventilation in areas of 
relative underperfusion, whether that be due to in the context of COVID and that question of anticoagulation, some uh, microvascular thrombosis that may predispose these uh, areas to that trauma that then develop these pneumatoceles, but then uh, if and as the patient improves, they can heal. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing more cases of uh, these pneumatoceles and pneumothoraces during hospitalization, um, in addition to uh, the peripheral ground glass that's been reported as sort of the, some of the diagnostic criteria uh, initially out of China. Um, but I, we are starting to see um, increasing case reports. Um, uh, seen a couple pop up in the last three weeks um, of people who have recovered seemingly from COVID who developed these pneumothoraces and then are found to have these pneumatoceles. Um, and so I think a highlight in this case that was important to think about is this, these pneumatoceles and pneumothoraces came up in the absence of any mechanical ventilation. And I think the phenotype that we're learning that uh, do have high incidence of pulmonary microvascular uh, thrombosis that may have predisposed, that's just a hypothesis, but um, it seems more pneumatoceal development than perhaps we've seen in the past in the absence of the mechanical ventilation. And I think as these patients move out of the hospital, as they come with shortness of breath, one thing to consider in your differential. So lung function, I wanted to sort of quickly um, preface it with an idea of what we've learned from the SARS and MERS of old, if you will. Um, just at the start of this um, uh, pandemic, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Journal of Rehab Medicine. Um, and I just sort of took a cut here of the outcome of interest. And um, they included uh, 23 studies. And I think for this portion of meta the meta-analysis, 18 of them um, included lung function testing. They also looked at things like PTSD and um, uh, function of the patient. So sort of the constellation of symptoms that might uh, uh, be called the post-intensive care syndrome. But I included here what their lung function was doing. And you'll notice uh, in the top here, um, the first uh, section is for those patients that, or the data was reported on up to six months follow-up. And these are pooled means uh, on this force plot here of what their, uh, the percentage of people that had impaired function in the different categories. And I'll point out that up to six months, 27% had impaired DLCO. Um, and uh, lower percentages, sort of six to 15% had either um, uh, impaired FEV1, FVC, or TLC, total lung capacity. They then uh, stratified that out into those that had six, over six month follow-up. And you'll notice the persistence, um, though quite a wide confidence interval, but still the persistence of those that had um, impaired DLCO, up to 25% of them, six months out. And again, this is from the previous SARS and MERS um, uh, epidemics. Um, smaller numbers, but still in the sort of 10% range had uh, impaired FEV1, FEC, and TLC. One of the challenges in these studies, though the numbers, the participants, there's quite a few there, we don't have pre-illness PFTs, and so are these a result of the disease or a consequence of some pre-existing condition? Um, and you'll see that uh, while there, uh, I'm going to present one study from the COVID literature, uh, there is not a lot, but I think that's an important question to consider. The best thing that I found so far, as far as lung function in COVID, um, was just published on the European Respiratory Journal. It's in print now. Um, and this uh, looked at PFTs, um, or lung functions, including spirometry, uh, gas exchange, and lung volumes at discharge. So either right before uh, discharge from the hospital or effectively on arrival to um, their rehab facility. And it's 110 patients. This was out of China. They do have, I didn't include it here, but uh, in their table one, they included the diagnosis of pre-existing uh, lung disease. And it was very few patients, something like only 2% of patients were listed as having pre-existing lung disease. We don't know what their spirometry was. So whether their spirometry is abnormal, you know, we can't say. Um, they divided these patients into mild, moderate, and severe. Um, and in the table, the table you're looking at here, mild is listed as mild illness. The moderate is pneumonia. And then severe pneumonia was considered the severe disease from COVID-19, uh, the disease process there. And what you can see at discharge from the hospital, so once they recovered, um, there was no differences in uh, the FEC of predicted. They're all right in the 90% range. The FEV1 was also in the 90% range across all. But again, we see this uh, change in DLCO. And particularly if you focus in on the severe pneumonia, 
um, being below 65% there, a bit of a wide uh, uh, confidence interval, or excuse me, standard deviation, and that has to do with a small number. Uh, but there was a, a, a moderate impairment in DLCO at discharge, which fits in line a little bit with uh, the meta-analysis I showed you previously. For mild um, and moderate disease, we did not see a um, sort of a notable uh, decrease, and that p-value there tells you that the severe pneumonia was different than uh, or that there's a difference across the groups, and it stands out in the severe pneumonia there. Um, they also then broke that down as to those that had a DLCO, the number of them that had a DLCO less than 80%. And you can see in each group there were some, um, and that's, I think, a very informative thing here, that the, the DLCO discharge, um, and we don't know how many of these are discharged actually on oxygen, but fits with what I've been seeing clinically, which is many patients may uh, recover to some degree, but have ongoing hypoxemia at discharge. And whether that recovers, I think, is, uh, is yet to be seen. Um, I'll point out, too, that there, they did notice, particularly in the severe, a reduction in lung volumes and their total lung capacity and a reduction in their RV uh, as compared to predicted. Um, and I've said it a couple of times, but I want to caveat this again with we don't know their lung function beforehand, but based on whatever diagnostic criteria they had for pre-existing lung disease, there was not much there. So not a ton out there. There was another study um, that did PFTs at discharge and two weeks later on a cohort of 18 patients, I think it was. Um, so not many. Uh, and it showed that whatever their PFTs were at discharge, they were similar two weeks later. Uh, I don't know that two weeks is enough time for any real uh, clinically meaningful change. And the thing that stood out there was, again, the reduced DLCO uh, in excess of the other lung function abnormalities. So some summaries from this is there, there are, and we're learning about pulmonary consequences from COVID-19, and that uh, should not be a surprise, especially given the knowledge we have from previous disease processes like uh, the SARS and, and MERS uh, epidemics before. But with these pneumatoceles and pneumothoraces are both in and outpatient, uh, seeing them after hospitalization, um, and case reports of patients exposed and not exposed to mechanical ventilation. Within our system, in the course of about three weeks, I think we had three or four patients uh, with um, pneumatoceles and pneumothoraces in the absence of mechanical ventilation. And so I think having a suspicion for that disease process is important. And as our case uh, that I showed you illustrates, it's really just symptomatic management. Those pneumatoceles should respond over time. Whether they have consequences to the uh, um, uh, DLCO or the gas exchange, I think is an interesting sort of correlation to the pulmonary function. Um, and this uh, reduction in pulmonary function appears worse in more severe disease. And what I mean by more severe disease is a more severe clinical syndrome associated with the SARS-CoV infection. Um, the, I sort of say the most quality literature, uh, that's my judgment of the literature, uh, but it's also, we're early in this process, so there just isn't a lot there. Um, it's, th that literature is just kind of right at discharge. And I think what, what is it gonna look like in three or six months is a very important question. And National Jewish Hospital here um, has started a COVID, post-COVID clinic. And I think uh, they're doing a bunch of serologic, but also pulmonary function testing, which I think will help us answer that question as time goes on. And then the previous SARS and MERS epidemics demonstrated these reduced lung functions, this DLCO volumes flow, and, and this most notable impact on diffusion capacity. And the discharge data from COVID-19, as I've said, is in line with that. And uh, the sort of true answer on that waits to be seen. Some anecdotal things that I haven't included here, uh, to, speaking to patients, I think the, excuse me, patients and other uh, pulmonary critical care doctors around the country, the challenge of uh, the sort of uh, strength loss associated with um, respiratory um, decline and, and sort of symptom uh, challenges. That meta-analysis I showed you that those with severe disease from SARS really had a decreased quality of life with high symptom scores for uh, respiratory distress and dyspnea and things like that, as well as PTSD. Um, things like chronic cough and weakness associated with this are coming up anecdotally. And so I think there is still a lot to be learned, but it is clear from mild up the spectrum to severe disease as people survive, there are and will be sequelae that we see in the months and years to come from this. Um, here's a list of the references I put in there uh, for you. And I see that there's probably a couple of questions in there. Uh, Christina, I don't know if you wanna bring those up as I stop sharing my screen. Yeah, Dr. Amos, that was awesome. Thank you so much. Um, while Dr. Breitler is setting, getting set up, I will share with you a couple of questions. You kind of just touched on this actually just a couple of minutes ago, but Dr. Um, I'm presuming doctor, uh, but Sandy Don is asking if you are aware of any guidelines on post-COVID lung function testing. And I know that I'll just let you 
I yeah. know that I don't know that answer. So right. well, sort of the guidelines on when to do them are challenging. I know that we're struggling with sort of even how to do them, right? And and the sort of time of a um, a tech in the room when someone's producing lung volumes is putting that tech at uh, perhaps some more risk, uh, as well as the challenge of doing the gas exchange studies, the DLCO. And so uh, ATS and SCCM have started putting out some guidelines, but our system um, is is waiting DLCO and things like methacholines, et cetera, probably for a few months still. And so I think the timing of it, uh, assuming you could get them within your system, I think the timing um, would likely depend on the patient's clinical scenario. So as they improve over time, I think it would be purely academic early to do it. But at that sort of three and six month time, I think that you'd start to see um, a leveling off of what their function is going to be. Um, and, you know, as a pulmonologist who has a, a pulmonary clinic here at the VA, it would be fascinating to sort of tie that to their old pulmonary function test and see what the change really is. Because I think that question is challenging. As we heard earlier, those with structural lung disease perhaps are at risk of more severe disease and those with more severe disease had uh, these worse lung function tests. But I think that's a, a confounding uh, phenomenon there, so. Yeah, that's great. <clears throat> um, also, uh, Dr. Dua, I was just gonna share she uh, was just share uh, that Dr. Du was just sharing experiences um, at Sinai in New York that they've seen a number of cases there with pneumomediastinums, regardless of whether or not the patients were on a mechanical vent. Mm -hmm. um, they all did fine with conservative management. I thought that was, um, you know, just nice to echo what you were um, sharing with us in your presentation. Really awesome presentation. A lot of great feedback here. Um, and um, so we'll see if there are any other questions that pop up and we'll save those to the end. And for now, we'll turn over to uh, Dr. Beitler. All right, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. Uh, so I'd like to talk about uh, some work we did in uh, March and April uh, to deal with the acute uh, shortage of ventilators uh, in our hospital system uh, here in New York City. Uh, regarding uh, disclosures, I receive uh, funding from the NIH, um, and unrelated to this talk, I do receive funding, or sorry, I've received speaking fees from a ventilator company, and I've done consulting work for another company that's not a ventilator company. Uh, I don't have their ventilators in my hospital, and I don't use them in any of my work. Uh, so uh, I wanted to talk briefly about um, our experience uh, uh, here in New York, just to give a little bit of background, because uh, I think the context is very important for what we uh, did, um, and then talk about uh, our acute ventilator shortage um, and what I think uh, uh, collectively we as a profession uh, can do to try to avoid uh, the scenario playing out elsewhere. So uh, if you'll bear with me here, I'm actually going to start by reading a, a, a poem that I wrote uh, a month and a half ago when this was all going on uh, for context. I've never seen war, but I imagine it much like New York today, a perpetual plunge into panic, hyper arousal and dismay. Streets are empty, stores are shuttered, subways desolate, Broadway's dark, field hospitals best the spring bloom, for the eye's attention in city parks. We care for critical colleagues unconscious and near death who may forebode our shared fate in their last agonal breaths. We face the fragility of our flat flesh, not together, but alone, for families will never meet and stories never told. Hundreds die here every day, too many for the morgues, so bodies pile in refrigerated trucks outside the wards. Patients die abruptly and alone because they must to stop spread of the contagion as our protective gear exhausts. We do our best with what we have, but our best thereof does not change the fact that we alone are not enough. Helps not coming in force, so is this the end of our arc? or can our best be enough for you, New York? So from a, a data standpoint, uh, this happened uh, very quickly. And uh, I think it's important uh, to recognize that what was uh, playing out in the newspapers and the news media was, uh, was actually in this case, a very accurate reflection. It was not sensationalized. Uh, um, if anything, uh, they didn't have a full grasp of just how uh, dire things potentially were um, behind hospital walls because media wasn't allowed into the hospitals. Uh, 
as an example, so the first case identified in all of New York State was on March 1st. Um, we started seeing an uptick in our hospitals, um, the, you know, in the third week of March. And you can see, uh, you know, we started, you know, in, I guess it was March uh, 15th or so, uh, 17th, I think it is, uh, with 28 patients across our hospital system who were in the ICU for COVID. And within a span of, you know, 10 or 12 days, uh, we were up to over 300 patients in our ICUs. And if you look at the bottom graph here, you can see almost every single one of those patients that was in an ICU was on a ventilator. So our hospital network, uh, the New York Presbyterian Hospital System has 2,600 inpatient beds and normally about 350 ICU beds um, across nine hospitals with acute inpatient care facilities. Uh, so you can see we more than doubled our normal ICU capacity across our hospital system. Uh, in terms of the particular hospital that I work at, uh, Columbia's main campus, our normal capacity is about 110 beds. Um, at our peak COVID ICU census, we had over 230 um, ICU patients, uh, all ventilated, not including uh, the large ICU that we were running out of the emergency department. Um, we were putting patients anywhere we could think of uh, that we could uh, convert space uh, quickly enough. So we had multiple operating rooms with patients in them. Our cardiac cath lab was converted to ICUs. We converted ward beds and step down beds into ICUs. The um, Children's Hospital of New York is actually adjacent to ours. And so we started putting adult patients in the Children's Hospital and staffing those ICUs. Um, we, as you saw in one of the pictures I showed, we converted our soccer field uh, at Columbia University uh, to a field hospital. Um, and as I mentioned, we also covered the, the ER. So we were um, truly exhausting any possible space we could find. In terms of outcomes, uh, they're, I think, relatively consistent with the data that have uh, more complete follow-up. Uh, overall, we have uh, roughly, you know, all across the campuses, somewhere between uh, 20 to 25% uh, mortality rate among uh, um, discharges. Uh, and this is obviously an evolving number with uh, some patients having stretched out hospital courses. Uh, and this is across all admissions, not specific to ICU. Our ICU mortality rate is, um, I think, in the 40 to 50% range, uh, which would be consistent, actually, not just for COVID, but for what you'd expect for uh, severe ARDS. Uh, so with that context, um, I, th I think one of the very unique things that happened that's hard to describe for people who um, working in other parts of the country is that the standard of care in New York fundamentally shifted. Um, the, the concept of best practice didn't really exist anymore. And both the hospital system and the state, as you'll see in the next slide, uh, adopt explicitly a crisis standard of care, saying that just do the best you can with what you have um, in this context. And uh, this was to the point that it was actually issued in an executive order by um, the New York state governor uh, where he provided um, uh, legal immunity from civil liability for anything that happened um, as long as it wasn't done in gross negligence. So all of the providers who were trying to do the best with what they, what they had um, were legally protected from getting sued from it as long as there wasn't a case of gross uh, negligence. This is a very powerful and perhaps controversial uh, order um, that came down from the uh, governor's office. So part of how that got translated in our hospital is we actually developed a pyramid staffing model. Um, so I, as an intensivist, uh, was responsible for um, four ICU teams, each that had roughly 15 patients. And so my job was to see 60 patients, all, on, all with severe ARDS on a ventilator every day. Um, and uh, that's what our, all the intensivists in our hospital were doing. Um, and that was in part necessitated by the fact that our ICU docs also cover other campuses. Um, so we were stretched quite thin, um, doing very uncon unconventional uh, staffing models. And as I think a lot of hospitals experienced, we had a substantial shortage in respiratory therapists as well. Uh, um, our RT to patient ratio was as bad as one to 84. Uh, so most of the ventilator management fell directly on the ICU docs, especially because you had non-ICU nurses coming into play, so they couldn't even do simple things uh, because they were um, new to the ICU environment and unfamiliar with ventilators. So in terms of ventilator shortages, uh, there are a couple different ventilators uh, that um, people have advocated using, all of which we've done. So obviously the full feature ventilators, which is what we normally use, anesthesia machines, uh, which we started using, uh, using very early on, 
The one caveat is they're very big and bulky and they might not fit in a lot of ICU rooms. So the use of anesthesia machines almost has to coincide with converting other larger spaces unless you um, have a hospital with very large ICU rooms. Um, we also used uh, uh, these portable or transport ventilators, if you will. Um, the ones that we had were the LTV. I'm not endorsing a particular brand. Uh, but we got several of these also from the national stockpile. Um, and then lastly, um, uh, uh, conversion of uh, non-invasive ventilators uh, to invasive support, uh, which is somewhat limited by the, um, the power of the, of the ventilator. So, but then what do you do when all of, you've done all of those things and there just aren't enough ventilators left? Um, and that's the, uh, um, the scenario that um, uh, New York City uh, was, was facing. Uh, both the governor and the mayor were openly talking about uh, an imminent exhaustion of the ventilator supply with projections um, coming within a matter of days. And I can tell you our internal numbers um, were at times even more dire than that. So, um, uh, you know, there's, there's often this push for uh, medical triage uh, um, and New York State is fairly unique and that we actually have uh, Department of Health, State Department of Health explicit guidelines on ventilator allocation uh, that was put in place, I believe, in response to a flu pandemic uh, uh, several years ago. Um, but the state has ex explicit guidelines on how to um, triage ventilators, um, basically relying on SOFA score and certain comorbidities that would mean imminent death. So if you had acute traumatic brain injury, um, or if you just experienced a cardiac arrest and now you're completely comatose afterwards um, with multiple signs of, of unlikely recovery, um, those would get triaged to not receiving a ventilator. Um, and then otherwise it was really reliant primarily on SOFA score. And this got to the point that hospital systems uh, were working with the State Department of Health to, uh, to plan to implement these. Uh, because of the um, projections of, of, of the shortage. Um, and, and so really what we were faced with is, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the other option being, being death. Uh, um, if, uh, if we couldn't come up with some way to um, stretch our existing supply of ventilators. And so I thought it'd be helpful to provide a timeline of how quickly this all evolved, just to get a, a, get a sense of how uh, rapid things changed in in New York and how rapidly they could potentially change somewhere else in the country or in the world. So um, uh, on March 17th, once our numbers started to uptick, uh, I got a call um, from my boss who got a call from the COO of the hospital asking uh, if uh, there was any way to split a ventilator to support multiple patients with a ventilator. Um, and I thought that was crazy, but said I would look into it. Uh, and so I spent the next couple of days developing uh, uh, a strategy just with test lungs on the bench and writing a, a draft protocol. Um, and that's around the time as I was doing this that these dire predictions started coming out from the city and the state of an imminent need for ventilator rationing. Uh, so by that Friday, I had a prepared protocol um, and I called uh, BTT is uh, uh, Boyd Tiller Thompson. Uh, he's the former medical director of ARDSNET and of the pedal network um, and a mentor of mine gave him a call uh, uh, basically in a cry for, for help. I wanted to make sure that we were doing the right thing and I wanted his help in putting together a team of experts who could scrutinize uh, what we were planning to do and scrutinize our protocol and make sure that it was as best as it's gonna get. Um, so he helped arrange uh, a panel of uh, respiratory therapists and, uh, and PhDs from across the country to help uh, review our protocol. Uh, so in the span of five days, then we were testing the protocol on an anesthesia machine in, in, uh, in test lugs. Uh, and that's Sunday, so five days later, uh, we actually had a dress rehearsal with the hospital leadership in the operating room um, with the heads of NYP and representatives from all of our hospital campuses uh, coming uh, to basically see what we thought we might be able to do. Um, that following Monday, the 23rd, we got approval from the New York State uh, Governor's Office directly um, and from our hospital ethics group. Um, and we opened the operating room as, as an ICU for the first time. And then the next day, you know, less than a week after, or one week exactly after we got the phone call, we actually started doing this. Uh, the following day, um, the protocol in response to uh, uh, some media inquiries ended up getting uh, publicly disseminated 
uh, via the Greater New York Hospital Association, which is our local hospital uh, consortium. Um, the following day, uh, multiple professional societies condemned uh, our practice. And uh, um, I just want to share um, a little bit of language from their joint statement. So you can see the societies listed at the top there. Um, and they say that they, quote, advise clinicians that sharing mechanical ventilators should not be attempted because it cannot be done safely with current equipment. In accordance with the exceedingly difficult but not uncommon triage decisions often made in medical crises, it is better to, pur to purpose the ventilator to the patient most likely to benefit than fail to prevent or even cause the demise of multiple patients. And so I, while I appreciate their caution, uh, this put us in a very difficult uh, spot because basically they're advocating for us to start triaging uh, ventilators and allowing patients to die and show me a, a risk prediction score that does that perfectly. Certainly SOFA does not. Um, so we felt a moral obligation to um, continue what we were doing uh, uh, and had multiple levels of input uh, to make sure that that was the right thing. That same day that the society statement came out, uh, the uh, Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services for the federal government emailed me personally to say that he and the Surgeon General were supportive of our efforts and to thank us for working on them. Uh, the next day, we integrated our screening protocol into the, um, uh, into the uh, um, electronic health record. Um, by the following week, uh, we felt that we were ready to go. We had done a, a handful of patients, um, and by the last pair, which I'll show you the data on shortly, um, felt that we were ready to scale up if necessary. Um, and so we paused for the ventilator sharing at that point until we ran out of ventilators. Uh, subsequently, Health and Human Services, uh, after that private email that they sent, uh, the, the Assistant Secretary and the Surgeon General actually publicly released our protocol, uh, essentially describing it as best practice. And so they tackled directly the issue of uh, um, people considering splitting the ventilators and what the alternatives might be, such as either death or handbagging patients. And this was actually going on in um, other countries in, in Europe. Uh, so there was a, a very real sense that this was coming here too with how quickly things were evolving. Um, and in that HHS statement, uh, they explicitly addressed the CDC and FDA guidelines, um, essentially saying that uh, if you feel this is the right thing to do, it's reasonable to do. They sort of covered liability concerns um, with it um, as sort of an off-label use of an existing, existing medical equipment, basically. Um, and, uh, and like I said, in this statement, uh, actually released our protocol um, across the country. So starting on April 1st, uh, we uh, converted additional ORs into ICU space um, to expand capacity uh, and had multiple academic centers around the country reaching out to us, uh, um, saying that they were going to adopt the protocol. And then thankfully the next week our ventilator supply started to improve and the following week our surge peaked. Um, so with the influx of uh, ventilators from California, Oregon and the national stockpile um, and being uh, having social distancing work, uh, we were able to avoid needing to do this on scale even though we felt we were uh, ready to do so. So, uh, so that's sort of the timing context. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that this was done as a public health initiative. We weren't doing this in a cavalier fashion at all. Um, before proceeding with this, we had an executive order from the governor of our state uh, explicitly giving us the green light to do it. And we actually, uh, our hospital leadership was talking with his team personally. Uh, um, this was an initiative that wasn't uh, initiated by me, but came from hospital leadership. They felt that something like this would be necessary and so asked us to work on it. Um, our hospital ethics committee um, explicitly approved it, you know, recognizing there are some difficult ethical uh, considerations. Um, and we actually had our IRB uh, take a look at it and concur that what we were about to do was not research. Um, that being said, uh, the ethics committee um, and us uh, felt that the best way forward would actually be to obtain consent, just like you would for any other ICU procedure, because obviously this is a, you can think of it in a way as an invasive procedure. It's something that, um, you know, is, is fairly unique. Uh, and so in that consent, uh, we explicitly acknowledged um, that, it would, that it was being done to benefit society and wouldn't directly benefit the patient unless we ran out of ventilators. So it was really being done for the public good. And I think one of the very admirable things about this is all the uh, surrogates that we approached um, consented for it because they recognized how, how dire things were looking at the time. Um, in terms of why we started doing this, um, we did it before uh, we uh, um, uh, 
uh, fully ran out of ventilators uh, because we thought it was important to gain experience in a controlled setting, both to determine if this was a realistic option and incorporate it with planning um, so that we knew what we were doing so we could scale rapidly um, if we needed to. Um, and to uh, plan the movement of patients and ventilators throughout the city, because if there are certain centers that are able to do this on scale, then you would potentially direct ventilators and patients to those places uh, because they have the capacity to support more ventilators as opposed to a model where every hospital is doing this on their own, which we thought would not be uh, um, safe. So this is our protocol. It's available online on the website listed there, protocols to nyp.org. Uh, the, the main point in showing this, or the two main points, are one, to acknowledge all the folks uh, from around the country who had input on this, um, and then second, to acknowledge uh, A through P here, this is far more than simple plumbing. This wasn't connect a couple of pieces of tubing and put patients on, and I think that is critically important to, to emphasize because that's a lot of what was out in the media at the time um, and in social media, and this is something uh, far more different that thought about patient management and not just plumbing. So in that theme, you know, I really think the greatest danger lies in the simplicity of the configuration. Um, it's so simple to connect a T adapter and put two hoses on the end of it. Um, but that simplicity also is what makes it so dangerous. Safe execution really requires picking the right patients, uh, having the right intensivists do it, um, and planning ahead of time what you're gonna do. So our protocol had some key safety measures I think is worth highlighting. Uh, one is the use of pressure control. Um, and the reason for that would be that uh, mechanical changes in one patient would not affect the other because you have two circuits in parallel. According to Ohm's law, the driving pressure would stay the same um, as something downstream changes in one patient. And we both uh, thought this theoretically, but also then tested it with test lungs as well to confirm that that was the case, that the ventilator would continue to function properly. Also our protocol mandates paralytics uh, so that one patient doesn't start triggering the ventilator um, and to prevent, <coughs> excuse me, uh, panel lift between patients. Um, we use, I think, uniquely uh, patient-specific inline monitors and alarms. So while the ventilator, you, even if you can split the plumbing, you still only have alarms for one patient. Um, you know, and in this case, it would be the two patients in aggregate. So we thought it was important from a safety standpoint to have independent alarms for each patient. We only used medical grade supplies um, we built in several safety checks throughout the protocol. Um, we thought about infection control with multiple antimicrobial filters and matching patients that would get paired by pathogen. Um, we used compatibility criteria uh, to make sure patients could be fully supported and several others that are reported in the protocol. So I wanted to briefly review the uh, compatibility uh, criteria. So part of it is fairly straightforward. You know, the sort of acceptable limits in either patients are <coughs> Uh, ideally what you would see in, uh, um, in an ARDS patient in general in terms of tidal volume management and that sort of thing. Uh, but we emphasize also between patient differences, uh, prioritizing driving pressure as the thing that we wanted to keep as similar as possible between the two patients because we knew that would influence uh, patient specific tidal volume on the shared ventilator. So I think another important thing that we did was uh, rather than just pairing two patients that looked similar, we actually matched them on ventilator settings before pairing them. And so uh, basically the way that worked is we would initiate deep sedation and paralysis, put them on uh, pressure control with identical ventilator settings, um, and make sure that each patient independently tolerated it on their own ventilator. So then there wasn't a question of whether they would tolerate it once you, share, uh, once you place them on a shared ventilator because they're already tolerating those settings. Um, we had specific safety checks built in there. Um, and we also had a safety check built into the shared circuit, uh, which was uh, um, once, uh, the proper ventilator settings were identified, we then uh, used the shared circuit, initiated those same settings with test lungs to confirm that there were no issues with the circuit leak or ventilator alarming or anything like that before transitioning patients. And so when we walked into the room to start this on two patients, um, you know, you'd, you'd have the two patients in the room and then you'd have this, uh, each on their own ventilator and you'd have a third ventilator that was already set uh, to the same vent settings and was inflating test lungs. You could visualize that everything was working properly before transitioning patients. So in terms of uh, uh, the first series that we did, uh, so we had a total of six patients, three pairs. Um, I wanna just highlight a few things here. So one is that um, patient pairs didn't necessarily have the same BMI. The second pair is a very good example where BMI of one patient's almost double the other. And similar for a predicted body weight. 
Additionally, uh, the one thing we prioritized was matching patients on driving pressure. And you can see that we did that uh, quite well here with the difference of driving pressure between two pair, between each pair being no more than two centimeters of water. Uh, tidal volume um, also was reasonably matched, but not ex explicitly so in the protocol. And you can see, for instance, the third pair, uh, one patient was at 6.1 cc's per kilo, the other one was at 4.4 cc's per kilo as the baseline values. Um, and then actually uh, underneath where I highlighted, you can see these were legitimately sick ARDS patients with quite low P to F ratios. Um, and while some of them had similar respiratory system compliance, they weren't necessarily matched in that either because what we prioritized was, um, was driving pressure was the thing that you were actually going to sit on the ventilator. So I wanna briefly show a video here of uh, uh, two patients that got this video last just about a minute or so. This video shows two patients with COVID-19 associated ARDS being supported simultaneously with one ventilator, a strategy termed ventilator sharing. The patients are spaced roughly eight feet apart with the ventilator and freestanding respiratory monitors between them. The patient specific monitor is placed adjacent to each patient's bed, making clear to whom the values belong. These monitors display patient specific tidal volume, flow and airway pressure and associated waveforms. The ventilator positioned in the middle is set to the pressure control mode to ensure mechanical changes in one patient do not affect the other. Ventilator displayed tidal volumes indicate the combined value. The circuit configuration includes a T adapter and redundant antimicrobial filters on the inspiratory and expiratory limbs. All supplies used are medical grade and intended for respiratory clinical care in mechanically ventilated patients. All right, uh, so that's what it looks like. Uh, so in terms of the, the data, so we recorded hourly, because we had this continuous monitors, we were able to record hourly uh, ventilator characteristics uh, between the patient pairs. And so this is the first pair, and I think one of the things that jumps out is that tidal volume is bouncing all over the place. Um, and the reason that happened uh, was because we were using pressure control as required by our protocol, and the HME filter uh, was getting saturated uh, quite rapidly. The reason that was occurring was because the first pair was the one pair that we did on an anesthesia machine. And uh, uh, we didn't fully anticipate how quickly the CO2 absorbent anesthesia in the anesthesia machine would get exhausted. Uh, but it was being changed um, every, uh, I think, uh, maybe three or four times a day. Um, and fluid was building up, liquid was building up in the ventilator circuit so quickly. So now the HME filter was failing, not only because you had exhaled moisture from the patient, but you had the CO2 absorbent converting CO2 to water, and then that water sitting on the other side of the filter. Um, uh, there were other important limitations, uh, especially around uh, alarm limits and sort of the physical configuration of the, the anesthesia machine uh, um, collectively, which uh, um, prompted us to never use an anesthesia machine again for uh, the purposes of ventilator sharing. But you can see, even with those issues in the bouncing and tidal volume, uh, um, patients were maintained within reasonably long protective ranges, you know, with tidal volumes between four and seven cc's per kilo for both patients. So there were no adverse events, even though um, there was this issue with the HME filter. With the second pair, uh, we learned our lesson and used uh, an ICU ventilator. Um, and so tidal volume was much more tightly controlled over time. You can see I highlight one example here where the HME filter uh, saturated and had to be changed, but that was once during a 48 hour period. Uh, however, the other thing you'll note is that tidal volume in one of the patients, once we started ventilator sharing, jumped up substantially. And that was something that we, I think, had written into the protocol, but hadn't fully appreciated how important it was to make sure that the patients are, are really compatible or fully matched after you initiate paralysis. So this was a case of a patient um, who, uh, or two patients were matched well on their ventilator settings with pressure control. Um, and, uh, and one of the two patients, uh, the blue patient, uh, was very actively breathing, including forceful active exhalation. And so uh, with that forceful active exhalation and, and profound dysynchrony, the patient had lower tidal volumes. And then once you paralyze the patient and you take away the dysynchrony, tidal volumes shot way up. And so our lesson here was to do a redundant safety check after the patient's paralyzed and everybody's matched on ventilator settings before um, proceeding uh, so that you avoid the sort of uh, unanticipated jump in, uh, um, in tidal volumes. The third pair, incorporating all those lessons uh, went exceptionally well. So you can see tidal volume was really uh, you know, quite steady uh, throughout the protocol. Um, there was one dip from uh, HMEF filter saturation, but again, that's just the nature of using uh, pressure control modes as resistance increases when the filter is failing, 
a tighter volume of job. And so one of the values of having independent patient specific alarms is you can more easily detect that subtle changes in tidal volume and respond accordingly. Uh, but otherwise, we felt that this third pair went uh, exceptionally well, um, incorporating our lessons learned from the first two. So with that, uh, the hospital leadership and our group felt that we were uh, potentially ready to launch on scale if it came to it. And so we developed a strategy for different clusters of ventilators uh, for different purposes, um, depending on what was needed, uh, considering you know, these sort of portable or transport ventilators, conventional ICU ventilators, repurposed anesthesia machines, repurposed purpose non-invasive ventilators and sort of acknowledging the limitations of them in sort of our hospital-wide schema for how we would port, uh, how we would support patients if it came to this. And this is all again available in our protocol. So I want to end by uh, emphasizing that uh, this, none of this should have been necessary. This should not have happened uh, um, in, in the U.S. Um, and I think it's, it's very disheartening that, that it did. Um, I think the reason for that is that, uh, you know, the premise that there were not enough intensivists or not enough ventilators to care for these surges uh, was just simply wrong. Um, it's, it's, it was simply not true. Um, we're a very big country with a geographically dispersed population um, such that infections will probably pop up in different parts of the country at different times. It's very unlikely that every major population center in the country would simultaneously um, uh, experience such a rapid surge as we saw over a period of three weeks um, uh, here in New York. And so basically what that means is that these acute staffing and equipment shortages are the direct result of, of fragmentation within our country. It's not that the U.S. doesn't have enough ventilators, it's that New York City did not have enough ventilators and our profession or our public servants or whatever it was who would be responsible um, did not respond accordingly to shift resources to where they were really needed um, in rapid enough time. And we were lucky that they just barely did, but it got to the point where these were the types of strategies that we were considering. And so this is really, you know, I think it's very easy to, to say the federal government needs to do more, uh, but the federal government is in charge of all these individual hospitals, right? Hospital leadership are also hoarding, you know, they were hoarding PPE. Everybody was wanting to hold on to ventilators in case the outbreak came there. Uh, weeks or months down the road, and it's completely understandable, uh, but it really sort of left New York on an island um, during, during the first wave of this uh, pandemic here. <coughs> and so what I think really needs to happen is that we need one healthcare system, uh, which we simply don't have. There needs to be coordinated movement of patients to areas of resources, moving resources to areas of need, and moving healthcare workers to areas of need. And that sort of mobility sort of happened in fits and starts, uh, during the surge in New York, but not in the serious way that would really need to happen if, if this came back again. Um, there needs to be interstate collaboration, which I think professional societies and hospitals uh, can own as well, not just, um, not just government officials. And uh, to some extent, New York uh, State took a positive first step on that. So they tried to break down some of the hospital system barriers where, you know, my hospital system might not work with another hospital system in the same city. You know, we wouldn't want to share our data because we're all trying to one up the other. And that's sort of the, um, the capitalist culture of hospitals normally. Uh, but New York State stepped in and they mandated that hospitals start reporting daily bed availability and daily ventilator availability um, to the state so they could potentially reallocate resources if it came to that. Um, so it was a good first step, but I think not enough. So in conclusion, uh, um, COVID-19, I think, really put our, our city's healthcare system on the brink of collapse. We're very lucky that it didn't get worse. Um, ventilator shortages can arise very quickly during the epidemic. So you saw within a span of two and a half weeks, uh, every ICU bed in our nine hospital system was occupied with an intubated ARDS COVID patient. Um, and another two or three weeks after that, we had more than double, uh, doubled our normal limit of ICU patients. Uh, so it happens very quickly. Um, and then lastly, I think ventilator sharing, it's definitely not uh, a panacea. Uh, and the way we envisioned it was that it would be a stopgap to buy time for relocating resources. Um, so if it got to the point where New York City hospitals were doing this on scale, we hoped that there would be enough public outcry that other parts of the country that had available ventilators or available anesthesia machines or what have you would shift them to New York uh, so that this would be a stopgap and not a long-term solution. Um, but I think it could potentially be done um, if pre-planned with well-matched patients in, in the right centers. Um, and lastly, I think ac across our profession and across our hospital systems, uh, more coordination would definitely save lives. Thank you.
That was incredible. Thank you so much um, for that talk. Um, I think everyone is um, is just kind of um, humbled and wowed by your sharing of that experience with us and walking through. Overall, um, you know, tonight's session was just very well received and um, and I've just been getting a ton of all the all the feedback is just this is awesome. This is incredible. So um, due to time, we will um, we will say good night to everyone. Thank you so much to each of our speakers. This was really an incredible night, extremely um, um, informative, educational um, and powerful. So thank you guys. Thank you again um, to Dr. Leong, Dr. Lapinel, Dr. Kriniski. Dr. Amos and Dr. Beitler. Thank you guys so much. Everyone stay well. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, okay?